All right, guys, we are going to do something I'm very excited for when it comes to the Oscars is we did our own categories, made up our own categories, gave it the little names and everything, and then made our own <clears throat> our own nominations and then the winners for them. Um, Kyle, what is going to be our first category? All right, so our first category is going to be Best Picture Horror Slash Thriller. We... This is a lot of the reason we did this, is to celebrate genres that really don't get represented at the Academy. Um, we are big horror fans. Huge, yes, we are. huge horror fans. So, uh, my nominees, um, you mind if I kick them off? Go right ahead, yeah. Okay, so my nominees for this are going to be The Pale Blue Eye, which I think is the number one most underseen film of the year. I, It's a Netflix film with Christian Bale about Edgar Allan Poe. And if that's not enough to sell you, I don't know what it is. But it's <laughs> fantastic. It's more on the thriller side than horror but really has got some great scares towards the end of the movie. Um, I have No One Will Save You, a great Hulu alien invasion film that was a lot of fun. Very little dialogue, just really, really great scares. Um, I had The Last Voyage of the Demeter. Fun, underrated, kind of silly at points, but just a fun Dracula movie. Um, I have Scream 6, fantastic movie. Probably my favorite since the original. And we've already kind of talked about it, but I have Infinity Pool as my there it is. horror movie of the year. Just fucked up and weird and scary and just fantastic. Yeah. Um, mine's a little close, but you've actually seen some more movies than, uh, than me uh, the, that, that, the past year. Mm -hmm. So um, those, some of them I haven't seen. Uh, but mine's pretty close. I've got uh, Scream 6 because, like you just said, probably one of the best since the original. Yep. Um, you've got uh, The Last Voyage of the Demeter because that was just a very fun movie. A little silly at times, but also just like pretty good. A little spooky in there. Um, I actually have uh, Talk to Me on here. I think I enjoyed it a little bit more than you did, but definitely, definitely up there. Very cool and, idea. And um, Cobweb did not have the biggest release. Like it was in theater for a very few amount of days, but there is some amazing points yeah. Um, in that movie, uh, <laughs> things that I love, things that I was like, that's kind of okay, but things that I love. Um, and my winner is Infinity Come Pool. On. Come on. <laughs> uh, it's just without a doubt. We've talked about it quite enough. Um, in the, just giving it in our, um, our, uh, own nominations and, and stuff like that, our own picks. Um, but, uh, yeah, Infinity Pool. What a movie. Yeah. I love between uh, Voyage of the Demeter and Cobweb. We were giving I don't even know the kid's name, but that kid some love because he is fantastic. In both yes, of those yes, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, Woody something. He's a great actor, and I want to see him in more things because he's so good in those movies. Mm -hmm. um, all right, next uh, award is going to be Best Picture Science Fiction Slash Fantasy. Again, just giving some love to some genres that never get love at the Academy. We love genre films. Mm -hmm. um, so to kick it off, my nominees for this are. Uh, Dungeons and Dragons, Honor Among Thieves. I have The Hunger Games, The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes. I have The Boy and the Heron. I have Godzilla Minus One. But of course, I have, as my winner, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. Love just it. Fantastic movie. Yeah. Um, mine's a little different than yours. Okay. Just a little bit. Um, I, I do have Hunger Games, The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes. Songbirds and Snakes. Um, just a bit of a mouthful. <laughs> I do also have Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, Honor, Among, Honor Thieves. Among Thieves. Um, and then I have Blue Beetle. Mm. Um, I just realized I read these in the wrong order, but don't worry. I've got Blue Beetle. Um, I have a movie called The Creator. And, um... Uh, I kind of already read out the winner, so we're going to go back to it. <laughs> right. um, and then I have a movie called Devil Conspiracy. Um, <laughs> I love this movie. And uh, that one definitely had the quietest release. I've never <laughs> seen anybody talk about it. Even their Instagram account where they are like uh, promoting it has like practically no followers. So mm -hmm. if you go watch that movie, it's just fucking weird yeah. in the most entertaining thing ever. But to kind of backtrack back to my winner, because I kind of read it out, it's Dungeons & Dragons. Okay, wow. Nice. Yes, that was a perfect um, adaptation of a role-playing game. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. Yeah. So entertaining, great casting, or just it's a good movie. I think if I'm going to give it a best picture for fantasy, that's Dungeons yeah. & Dragons, Honor so Among good. Thieves. Entertaining. Like, it's just so entertaining. easy to watch. A good, fun movie. Yeah. I think we saw it twice in we theaters. Did. Yeah. <laughs> Um, all right, and then our last Best Picture uh, category is Best Picture Action and Adventure. Um, okay, so 
I'm going to say it. I love action adventure. Not a lot of great ones this year, but the ones that were great were really, really fun. Yeah. Like, very, very fun. Um, so my, my nominees are going to be Fast X. Just with this movie series, I honestly just think you're not allowed to not like the new ones anymore because if you were at the 10th movie and still have the same problems, you know what these are going to be at this point. Yep. They're going to be fucking ridiculous. They're going to be about family. They're going to be ridiculous car chases and explosions. And that is all I want from these movies. And this delivered on that. It was so fun. Jason Momoa, king. Um, I have Mission Impossible, Dead Reckoning Part 1. That is a mouthful. Um, uh, (laughs) A bit underwhelmed at points from it, but I think it's yeah. because we haven't seen part two. You know, I, I want to see the finished story, but for what it was, it was a lot of fun. It Tom was. Cruise doing what he does best, ridiculous stunts and being well, charismatic guy. and flirting with every woman on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> um, fantastic. Uh, I have Blue Beetle. Hmm. I have Sisu, another kind of quiet release of the year. There was. Not a lot of people saw Sisu and talked about it, but it's really fun. It's just a guy killing Nazis for the whole movie, which is super fun. And the, the fights in it are brutal, and there's a lot of gore, and it's just a lot. It's oh, just yeah. Very fun. Um, but my winner is one that just made me, like, question how they even made it. it for me, to, I think is a new defining point in the action genre. To be a little hyperbo- hyperbolic. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's John Wick Chapter 4. There it is. Yeah. I, just, I love the series. John Wick is one of my favorite franchises and could not have ended on a higher note. Truly. Yeah. I mean, they just, they, it's a series that some series get better with each movie. I don't think that's the case for this because one holds a really special place in my heart. But every time they've released one, they have just one up themselves in terms of like the things that they can do. Which is crazy. Yes. Every time I saw you, you watch one and then you watch two and then you just keep going and you're just like, Every time you finished it, you'd be like, there's no way, right? And then you watch the next one and you go, okay, there's no way, right? And it keeps going. Yeah. Just incredible stuff. Fantastic action movie. Yeah. And I'll just blast through mine pretty quickly because they're pretty similar. Uh, Sisu, you were right. Uh, pretty underwhelming release. Like, I didn't see anybody talk to talk about it. But guys, go watch it. It's great. <laughs> it's simple. Um, and Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1. Mouthful. But a great movie. Um, you're right, a little underwhelming at times, but, I mean, I I love Mission Impossible. Tom Cruise and his stupid stunts, like, it, it's great. Watch that man run. It's just... <laughs> um, Fast X was... You already took it out of my mouth. Like, it is... It is a stupid, stupid action movies. And if you're complaining about it, why? 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 Just turn your brain off. Go watch the movie. Yeah. I don't care if you can't do that. Just go. Do it. Just enjoy the movie. Come on. Yeah. You can't tell me Jason Momoa in that movie is not the <laughs> most entertaining thing. He's and so also, good. John Cena, who was, what, the villain in the movie the prior, prior, I movie, think? Yeah. yeah. And he's back and as he the brother. Comes, yeah. And I'm like, come on. Fantastic. Um, and uh, Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. I enjoyed... Um, a lot more than I think a lot of people did, but I enjoyed it a lot. Yeah. Um, so you've got, you know, um, uh, Indiana Jones 1, 2, 3, and 5. Um, mm-hmm. Just the 4. And the winner, I mean, we were just talking about it, John Wick Chapter 4, the action movie of the year, and just a long time. I think uh, for me, though, Chapter 4 is the, the, the best one. Oh, I do too. Oh. I just meant they didn't get better each time because I have one as like my second favorite. But oh. no, four is the absolute yeah. best. Yeah. Oh, so then that was, I guess, where I disagreed because I thought it was, I one was great and then two was better and then three was better. And oh, so you think it yes. just got better every I time. I thought it got okay. better every that's time. Fair. That was no, what fair. I was, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but, uh, I mean, if I could give all the love in the world to this movie, I would. I listened yeah. to the soundtrack a bunch afterwards. I listened to, um, I would watch clips. Like, it's... It's just insane how much they do in that movie. I think it's a pretty lengthy movie. It is, yeah. And it's entertaining the whole way through. And another reason why we talked about that stunt thing that they did during the ceremony, we need a, a stunt Oscar. Because the stuff that yeah. they do in this movie, like, Keanu was at risk of dying making this movie. Really? He was. I mean, it's, yeah, fantastic. Um, all right, moving on to a, a category they will be bringing to the Academy next year. Um, best cast and now we don't know what the qualifiers are going to be for them Mm -hmm. Um, we just decided to kind of go with our own qualifiers Um, uh, so for my my nominees I'm going to go with Barbie I just think that every single Barbie is perfectly cast every single Ken is perfectly cast Yeah. we bring in Will Ferrell and America Ferreira just great stuff Um, I have the boy and the heron every voice acting role in that is just so well done Um, 
even the ones where you don't even know it's them until the end of the movie. Mm-hmm. It's just fantastic stuff. Um, I have the Iron Claw, which is not a big cast, but I think if it's a movie that's going to be centered around one family and a bunch of brothers, yeah, they really all have to feel like brothers. And just Zac Efron, Jeremy Allen White, and Harris Dickinson. Um, I forget the younger brother's name, but they all just they genuinely feel like they love each other and they're brothers and like the dad is a piece of shit but he also feels like a real dad and just everyone is so well cast i love love the iron claw um i also have asteroid city for just a ginormous cast um great stuff i mean it you mentioned scarlett johansson as your your best supporting actress great great pick jason schwartzman carries the movie He's been in, I think, like six Wes Anderson movies now, and I think this is probably his best collaboration. I just yeah. fantastic. Um, I uh, love Steve Carell and his little side role, but come on, my my winner is absolutely going to be Oppenheimer. It's just the cast that Christopher Nolan put together for this film was unbelievable. It's one of those things where you're watching the movie, and other than being so caught up in the story and just the, the film itself, every five minutes, you're like, wait, I know that guy. I know that guy. I know that guy. You know, just in these huge, huge names. Big names, but also people who would just have not had the limelight for a while. And I love the way they kind of had to come back in this film. Um, yeah. Great seeing um, the guy from, I forget his name, the guy from the Santa Claus movies, the elf. Uh, fantastic. Oh, just my gosh. Randomly yeah, popping yeah, yeah, up yeah. in the movie. Just really random. Like Jack Quaid shows up in the film. Oh, for my like gosh. Five minutes. Yeah. Love seeing all of them. Really, really just, just if you're going to tell a film like that that has such a spanning story over years about this this project that they had, casting every role is crucial. And I think that they nailed it with every single role cast. So yeah. that's got to be my winner. 100%. You said that perfectly. And funny enough, um, I'm just going to be repeating everything you just said. Um, <laughs> best casting. Um, or best cast, is it? Best, best cast. cast, yeah. yeah. Um you mentioned Oppenheimer. Um, you uh, mentioned Barbie. You mentioned um, Asteroid uh, City, right? And then um, also the boy and the heroine. But for me, it, my winner is Poor Things, actually. Nice. Um, I think the uh, cast is incredible. I think um, to be able to play Bella Baxter and like that, how intricate that character is and how she just continues to keep growing through the movie and keep changing like over a, just a, what feels like a pretty lengthy amount of time and they shortened it into like that movie it she changes a lot and Emma Stone did it beautifully uh, Mark Ruffalo was incredibly funny um and just like an asshole but like so funny ridiculous. just yeah ridiculous yeah. like you said earlier a man child yeah um uh Willem Dafoe uh is just Willem <laughs> Dafoe great every time um, and some names and faces I did not uh, recognize in there. Um, and they were just as incredible. Um, yeah. But, yeah. Love that movie. Great pick. Um, all right. Moving on to a fun one. Best fight. Like we said. Ooh. Action, yes. adventure, kind of back and forth. But there were some really, really fucking cool fight scenes in this year. Yeah. I'm excited. Um, yeah. So, for my nominees, I'm going to kick it off with one that we have not mentioned a single time. It was one that I was really excited for that I found a little underwhelming, but I want to revisit. Uh, I have the fight between the killer and the brute in the killer. Oh, Um, so if you've seen the film, this is his first kind of fight scene in the film. He shows up to a house and I believe it's Florida and, um, I hate this, but drugs the dog to get past the dog gets into the house. It's a dark house. And then this huge, huge guy gets back home and they have this brutal fucking hand-to-hand fight. I forgot about that. Fantastic fight. I mean, the whole movie, this is why I say I want to rewatch it, because I didn't love it as just a straight drama, but I guess I've heard on Twitter, if you kind of watch it as a comedy about a killer who is so bad at being a killer, it's a lot more fun. Okay. And I love the way the fight kind of demonstrates that. The man gets his ass handed to him <laughs> the entire time. But it's, it's just a brutal hand-to-hand fight, and I'm a sucker for, like, just fights that have no fanfare to them it's just about the hits and like the just the combat yeah I, I, I love that scene it's so well lit too um completely changing the tone though my next pick is the football field fight from bottoms oh <laughs> i love this scene the funniest oh. <laughs> just the ultimate cul- culmination of such a ridiculous movie um i mean the movie is just fight club with girls and then you get this incredible fight at the end on a football field slow-mo with the uh, this music playing in the background and it's just it's so bloody for no reason yes (laughs) it's so it reminds me of anchorman i don't know if you've seen i have not there's a scene at the end of anchorman where 
I don't even know how it happens, but a bunch of news people all get in this all-out brawl. Oh, I love it. In a lot, like a parking lot. And, like, at one point, Steve Carell's uh, character throws a trident into a guy's chest. Like, it's it reminded me of that because it's so fucking ridiculous. Like, it's just so nonsensical, and I love it. Fantastic that is incredible. Um, my third pick is going to be another one I don't think you saw yet, but it's going to be the final fight from Creed 3. Uh, the final boxing match yeah. from Creed 3. Um, I'll see the Creed movies eventually, but... Not today. Um, Not today. Uh, another movie where, like, I didn't love it as much as the first two, but where it's shown was definitely in the fight choreography. Um, Jonathan Majors plays the uh, rival to, to Adonis Creed, and just... I love when a director... A director's taste so clearly shows in the way they make a movie. And Michael B. Jordan directed this film. This is the first time he directed a film, along with starring in it, and... Um, He's a huge, huge weeb, a huge anime fan, <laughs> and the third or the final fight in this film feels like an anime fight. Like it is so dramatic for no reason. It's just a boxing match, but they are going back and forth. All the lights from the scene cut out, and all like there's like shadows on the wall of them fighting, and it's just it's so cool. It feels like an anime fight, and that's I, I have it typed out as anime fight from uh, Creed Three. Like it's just <laughs> so fun, so fun to watch. Um, my other nominee is uh, the No Sleep Till Brooklyn fight from Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. Yep. Just an iconic scene. I mean, we know that James Gunn knows how to fucking choreograph a, a scene to some music. And this yeah. was, I think, the best instance of that. I just, I love the way he uses music in his, in his films. And this is probably the best use of it ever. Um, just the, the, the long tracking shot through all of these characters fighting and... Um, it's brutal too. You get to see Gamora because this isn't like our Gamora. This is a full killer Gamora just going in on some of these people, and it's yeah. just so fun to watch. I love this scene. Um, but my winner, we just talked about with action. It's got to be. It could be any number of fights from John Wick Chapter Four. Like there are so many, but I'm gonna go with what I call the top down shootout, which just if you're a video game fan, it'll make you lose your mind. Like it's just. Uh, it's so impressive for John Wick, the series, to have a specific style in the way they shoot uh, fight scenes, and then to completely abandon that for one scene. Like, it, I've never seen them do something like this before. Yeah. And he enters into this room, and the camera tilts up, and you get this incredible sequence of him going through the room, blowing people away, bringing in a flamethrower. Like, there is just insane things going on, but the angle stays from the roof down, and it's such a unique scene. Fucking fantastic stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to blast through mine to get to a very similar point. Yeah. Um, so you made a wonderful point about the movie Bottoms with their um, end scene of like, well, I guess not end scene, but like that just the, the, the fight. football fight is incredible. It's hilarious. The, the slow-mo, the blood, it's just, it's go- It's so, so funny to such a ridiculous movie, but in the best way. You've got um, the hallway fight uh, to uh, No Sleep Till Brooklyn in Guardians of the Galaxy 3. Um, yeah, absolutely incredible. You took the words out of my mouth. Um, perfect, beautiful, my favorite. Uh, introduced me to that song as well. So, like, that was just dope. Um, you've got, um, uh, I'm gonna bring some light to a movie you did not bring up. Uh, uh, Teenage, uh, Team and T, uh, Teenage mm. Mutant Ninja Turtles, Mutant Mayhem. Their fight montage. Oh. Uh, with, uh, what's the song no name? No Diggity. No Diggity. Fantastic. Incredible. Yeah. Incredible. That, huge shout out to that. Um, it was hard to pick one fight from Sisu, mm. but um, I'm going to go with just something that kind of kicks off the movie, and you go from like, oh, shit. We watched the trailer, and it had that in it, and we were like, wait, wait, we need to see this. Yeah. And it's just that first Nazi encounter where he's like, you uh. know, on a horse, and is like he's got his dog, and they're trying to shoot the dog, and the dog's running away, and he just gets so pissed off that he just goes like, immediately, he's really brutal. It's so good. Great scene. Pulls you in. To the winner that you just mentioned, John Wick <laughs> Chapter 4, that top-down uh, gunfight is incredible. So good. It's so unique. I've never seen anything like that in a movie. I've only ever seen that in video games. So, so, so cool. And, I mean, every fight scene is incredible. Um, and because you already took the words out of my mouth for that, I want to give a, just a bit of a shout-out to another scene in that um, that was literally my, like my runner-up for it, and it's the, the club fight. Where oh, there is, yes. it's amazing oh, yes. lights and crowds of people and fighting and it like it 
transitions from like just like the, him fighting a bunch of people to like a, a one-on-one in the most brutal way ever he falls lands on his back on a metal like Ugh. just steel beam yeah and then like falls into the ground and like the water and everything it's so so cool so good. which is like like if, if there was no top-down fight it would be that fight yeah isn't that the one that turns into like a, a three person fight too? When the other is two there show another up? person? I think so. I it's just him remember and the it's, big guy. For a yeah, while. it's him and, and the big guy. Which That's that what I remember. Yes, yeah. yeah, fantastic. Um, just a shout out, also like another honorable mention: the tunnel fight in Blue Beetle fucks so hard. It does. Great scene. It does fuck. Um, okay, I love that. Great category. Yeah. Uh, moving on to a such a difficult one to narrow down to five, but this is going to be our best scene. Parentheses drama. Best dramatic emotional scene from the year. A lot of just really emotional movies this year, guys. I got sad year. Sad year for movies, but it was great. Um, sad year in a in a good way. way. In, in a, a good in way. In a healing way. Yeah. Um, so for my f- uh, five nominees, I'm, I'm very go. excited about this one, by the way, because oh, yeah. it's best scene, not movie. So we could agree on movies. Yes. But now we're picking up the scenes. The, the defining just, scenes of the year. Yeah. yeah. It, it, this is going to be very unique, and I'm very very excited to see. Yeah, this is our way to kind of rant about why we love these movies. Is yeah. The scenes that define the movies. Um, so to kick that off is, I kind of put names for each of these scenes. My name for this scene is Rocket's Purpose in Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. Aww. And this is essentially the scene where Rocket goes off on his own at the end of the movie to save the rest of these captured animals, opens up the, a cage where a bunch of baby raccoons are. Um, I can't talk about this one too much or I'm going to start crying. But it is, uh, yeah. yeah, it's uh, just a... I wonder if that's going to be every nomination. It's going to be like <laughs> each of these, but it's just beautiful. It, it, I love when a film has a, a thesis, like a, a thing that they're saying, basically, and then a scene just shows that. There's a scene earlier in the film when he's kind of in the afterlife, like almost dying, and Lila tells him, uh, there's the hands that made us and the hands that... I can't... I, I'm going to butcher the line, but essentially tells him, like, you were made for something more. Yeah. And he doesn't believe that. He thinks that he was made just to be an item to be thrown away into the trash. And this is that scene explained, like him saving these raccoons and giving them another chance and letting them live a life that he didn't get to. That's his purpose. That is mm-hmm. why he is where he is. That's why he's the leader of the Guardians of the friggin' Galaxy. Like, he's the new leader because he does this. He saves... He's the one who even decides to go back. He knows we got to save all these animals because I was a, I was captured and they can't be, you know. Yeah. And it's just the it, the music is beautiful. The way the music kicks in, this orchestral like choir kicks in, and the camera shows like raccoon over where they are, and it helps him figure out that he is a raccoon. What we've all been telling him for three movies, and it's just it's beautiful. It's so emotional. Cal can tell you we saw this movie like I think I saw it maybe three times in the theater, but when we saw it, I was an absolute fucking mess during this scene. Yeah. Just full yeah. weeping. Um, Wait, you were crying? But you were crying? <laughs> <laughs> um, that's my first nominee. Sorry, I don't want to go off too long about all these, but uh, my next nominee is uh, the one I call Nora and Hai Song Part Ways in part, uh, Past Lives, which is essentially oh. just the ending scene of the film. Um, we've been talking a lot about how most of this film is just longing gazes and that is all this is <laughs> and it it works it made me cry like it is just the scene where after a whole movie of them reconnecting and it just the film shows us this beautiful connection between these two people who really in another life would probably be in love um, yeah. they they walk she walks him back to his uber and as they're waiting for his uber it is a still shot just on the two of them staring at each other and that's it and it, it, you would think on paper that's going to be boring, but it's not. It's the most emotional scene of the film. It's just, yeah. there's no words because nothing has to be said. They know that they they saw each other again, and that's all they needed to do. Now, now they can live their lives, you know. Um, You're making me feel how that, exactly how that movie made me feel right now. Yeah, just talking it's, just about a, it's it. a yearning feeling. Ugh. It's just, it's so beautiful. And then, of course, you know, after he leaves, she walks, there's like a tracking shot on her walking back, and then she doesn't show any emotion when she le- he she hugs him and he leaves. She walks back to her uh, boyfriend or husband, husband and husband. just collapses into his arms, like fully is crying. And it's just, for shout out to the boyfriend too, or husband, it, I love Boy, his role, I whatever, her partner. His, yeah. his role in this film is really beautiful because he fully understands that she has this powerful connection with another human being that he just won't fully understand, but he's okay with that. Like He's not at all jealous and he's not insecure about it, and seeing her so emotional about him leaving, he's not upset. He fully just comforts her and takes her back inside. Yeah. And, 
it's just a beautiful ending to a beautiful film. I think if I ever just use one word for that film, it's just beautiful. It is just a yeah. beautiful film. Um, so that's my number two. My other nominee is the one I call the Von Erich Brothers Reunited in the Iron Claw. Um, one that I don't, I don't want to talk about too much, not because it's just emotional, but because I know a lot of mo- people still haven't seen this movie and I don't want to ruin things. It's just a scene where... It's like I said, uh, the brothers are reunited and I can't really say much more, but it is because of the way it's shot and because of the way the events of the film have led up to it, it is, again, another another scene where I was just a blubbering mess. I um, saw this film at a really just, after a really shitty week anyway, and it was just, I was at the kind of the perfect emotional place to watch it. Like I was, some would say too emotional, but just a place where I was just raw enough for the film to actually hit me. Like it just... I, movies about brothers are always going to get me anyway, but just, I mentioned earlier about the cast, uh, they all play their roles so well that you genuinely believe such a, like, sincere brotherly love between them, and I think movies don't do that enough, where they just unabashedly show brothers that love each other. It's often brothers who have, like, complicated relationships with each other and who fight, and yeah. it's more like sisters who would just love, love each other, and I think there's a gender thing in there that people just can't get around sometimes, but... It was really refreshing to see a film where these brothers just unabashedly love each other and are like hugging the entire movie and just that's beautiful to me. I just I don't see that a lot in the way masculinity is portrayed in films. And so that was really refreshing. And this scene in particular is that to a T and it is beautiful. It's a fantastic scene. Um, And then for my fourth nominee is going to be Jones Hall, who plays Augie Steenbeck's Breakthrough in Asteroid City. Um, it's hard to explain this film and the scene because the movie is really cool in that it's like a radio play about a play about a movie, (laughs) you know, like it's, there's so many stories within it, but essentially this is the, I mentioned how the guardians one was like the point of the film described in the scene. And this is also the same thing. It's towards the end of the film or it is the end of the film. It's, um, the main character, it's cutting out of like the asteroid city portion back to the black and white play portion and he walks into the director's room and he's like I just don't get it I'm not understand am I doing it right am I doing this right and he says like I don't understand the play and the director tells him that's okay just do it anyway and you know the music is playing and he walks out of the the room and walks out to this terrace overlooking the city and sees a great Margot Robbie cameo um the woman who was supposed to play his wife in the film and I've never seen such a layered scene where it's not just him talking to an actress. It's like a grieving husband talking to his wife, you know, and she basically reads the dialogue that was supposed to be in the play if she played the wife. And it's about a, the wife coming to him in a dream and him telling her that he misses her and all this stuff, but fully gives him this breakthrough of like, just because I don't understand the point of what I'm doing doesn't mean I shouldn't be doing it. And we, we talked about this movie a lot after we left and like just sat in the car and kind of raved about it. And I think the whole, there was a lot of movies last year that kind of covered this about how life is just such a precious thing and we should be, we should be living, even though it's hard sometimes. I think that's the point of Asteroid City. Just saying, I don't understand it, but I'm doing it anyway. I don't get why life is the way it is. Um, Life can be very hard sometimes, but like, that's okay. That's part of the journey. It's okay to not get it and still do it anyway. Um, And I just, that scene really fucked me up. Like it just, it hit me in a real, real soft. I think anyone who kind of relates to some of the stuff in the movie will understand that, but it just hit me in a very soft place. And there's a big reason why I am so indebted and grateful to Wes Anderson because he makes movies that are just so real and about stuff like that, you know? Yeah. So just a great scene. Um, But my number one, is it's going to be kind of a pivot because it's not necessarily all those were scenes that just really made me emotional and just very tender scenes this is one that's not necessarily a tender scene but i can't deny it is one of the most shocking just visceral scenes i've seen in something and that is the victory rally in oppenheimer it feels like a horror scene in a movie that is not necessarily a horror movie yeah um this is the scene after the bomb has been used in hiroshima you cut back to this victory rally where, where Oppenheimer is giving a speech to this crowd who just thunderous applause Americans who just don't grasp what they just did essentially in, yeah. in bombing an entire nation. Um, Oppenheimer does though. He grasps it and he did the horror on his face. I think there's plenty of scenes you could say won him the Oscar, but this is certainly one of them. Just the shock and horror and disgust on his face 
And then it's just the way it's shot. Like, it's just Nolan flexing the entire time of the way they <laughs> cut in between the screams of the people. And then, like, he's yeah. walking past, like, corpses on the ground. And it's just... It's a scene that, like, if you weren't already locked into Oppenheimer, because it is pretty far into the film, if you weren't already locked in, it just grabs you by the shoulders and, like, shakes you. Like, it just grabs you and, like, this is why you're watching this film. Yeah. We are not celebrating nukes here. Like, this we are. This is not a pro-American film. This is yeah. a film that is a warning. Like, this is, this is the reality we live in as a country now. And it just is such... People have been saying so often that Oppenheimer is a, quote, important film. This is why. Like, it's important that we see things like this to, to rattle us and shake us up a little bit so that we don't get complacent in our role in, in nuclear warfare. Like, yeah. I, I just, I think that's, it, it's such a shocking scene. And for a movie that has so many defining scenes, this is the one that just, I remember being in the theater watching this for the first time, thinking this is going to be my favorite scene of the year. Like, and it never changed. It, yeah. there, there's so many scenes that I love, but this was the one that just stayed with me the entire time. So that's that's got to be my winner. Beautiful picks, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful picks. <laughs> um, I love how different they're going to be. So mine, we're gonna start off with um, Society of the Snow. Um, there is a scene where they—I don't have cool names. Um, there's a <laughs> scene where they have a radio that like kind of works, and they're able to like tune into the news and find out what the world is saying about mm. this horrible crash. And there is a a moment where it's been too long and they can't keep searching. Yeah. And these group of people who are freezing to death, running out of food, uncomfortable in ways that they couldn't imagine being uncomfortable are finding out that no one is coming for them anymore. It is... If that movie didn't already have my attention, it, like you just said about the Oppenheimer scene, grabbed yeah. you by the shoulders and pulled you in. Mm -hmm. Kind of like slapped you a little bit. Like, pay attention. It... Uh, it it's chilling to see so many different reactions from these people realizing that they're not going to be saved. Having that realization, watching people be shocked, watching people be angry, watching people cry and freak out. And it was... It's hard to pinpoint a favorite scene because there's also an avalanche scene that was Oof. terrifying. Yeah. But this one might actually be my favorite from that movie um, because of how intense it is. Yeah. It's, it's a lot. Um, my next one here, um, I think you'll also like, um, in the movie, All of Us Strangers, towards the end, he's talking to his parents in the diner, mm. and that, I mean, there was a lot of scenes from that movie, but, like, a lot, and yeah. I was having a hard time pick, picking one, but I knew I wanted to pick something from this movie, but this scene specifically wrapped everything up and made me cry like a little baby, um, <laughs> so... Uh, I don't even know what else to say about that scene besides... Because yeah. I, like, I don't want to talk about it too much because it's, like, it's just dialogue. Yes. And the, their their faces and just dump a dialogue. Like, go watch it. Go go watch it. I, <laughs> I don't... I, yeah, it is. I that, that one I don't even want to bring more attention to. Just go watch it. Yep. Just go watch it. They're talking... It's like a diner, right? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yep. They're talking in a diner. Go watch it. <laughs> um... The uh, next one is Anatomy of a Fall. Um, uh, that one was also a hard one to pick a scene mm. from. Um, this one is just more in intensity. Uh, the last one I had was sad, but this one's more intensity. It's They have an argument. <sighs> and um, Which is always so funny because it's a married couple that wrote this, but yeah. uh, they have an argument and it is intense because yeah. you go... For, it's a defining point in the movie as well where... Um, you can't tell if Sandra has committed this crime or not. And this is a moment in the film for me where I went, did you do this? I was kind of on your side. Did you do this? Yeah. And it's intense. Sucked in. Was probably holding my breath for half the scene. 
um, and there's a, I have a quote here where she just like it, it's like what everyone has when they tweet out the scene or whatever. Oh yeah. And it the the, the quote is just like you are not a victim, and it's like it's just oh my gosh because yeah. you keep finding out more and mm-hmm. you're just like oh my gosh what a beautiful movie beautiful movie great scene yeah it's an intense movie that, that won them the best original screenplay Oscar for yeah sure. like that has scene. to have yeah it's. It's just such a great movie, but that scene is up there. There's a lot of scenes that are up there for me, but that one, argument scenes are always just chilling. Yeah. Um, kind of, uh, yeah, chilling is the best one. You get goosebumps from it. You know, your hair stands on end, and you're just like, you're like, oh, you've kind of like got to shake it off a little bit. It's, that one's, that one's good. Um, another one, it, the whole movie of The Zone of Interest hmm made me feel sick to my stomach because it is on a topic that is talked about a lot. It gets frankly joked about a lot. Um, And this movie takes all that being desensitized like immediately away. And you remember exactly how deeply horrific everything was and kind of hard to pinpoint a scene. But then as the movie is wrapping up, there's a scene that does remind me how sick to my stomach I am about the whole thing and it is the final scene yeah where he's walking down these stairs and he's also being like sick yeah and it's cutting to the the museum i believe it's like the current museum, the museum. yeah um showing uh the only one i can even remember vividly is shoes. the shoes yeah um and i think adding that into that movie was Probably the best choice, the best, oh, yeah. the best thing they could have done Stroke to add to that movie. Yeah. Um, Stroke of brilliance. That was a great way to put it. Um, that was definitely up there in the best scene for like a, a drama yeah. scene. Um, just, it just reminds you of everything. Yes. It just brings <laughs> you back to earth of just like, holy shit. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, my winner here, we're going to be talking about the same one. It's the victory rally scene. Yeah. Uh, just it's, it's like you said, if you're not already in to that movie, you're into it now. It was horrifying because it's the kind of what I just talked about when it comes to the zone of interest. You are, uh, and you could tell Oppenheimer himself is also being into that. You're just like, what? have I just done for his point of view and for us you're just like oh my god this really is just fucking sickening you're watching everything and you've kind of forgotten forgotten um forgotten uh forgotten what we're watching them yeah create you're kind of like oh yeah they're they're developing more things like watch their brains be put together and you're like yeah yeah oh my fucking god it's like an inspiring movie, and then it's very quickly not. <laughs> yeah, that scene, I think, is the defining point to remind you it's not uh, a scene or a movie about some great invention. Yeah, this is not been it's meant to be a not. triumphant moment. Yes, yeah. it's not. That scene brings you, and that's what transitions it to the rest of the movie, um, yeah. where it's not, it's not great <laughs> at all. Everything that you were kind of like, I don't know, I found, I found myself being like, ah... Oh, like, you know, that they, they can't, they, they, you know, another failed, another failed, another failed. You're like, man, I know you guys are going to get it. When are you going to get it? Kind of want to see that scene. And then you're like, I didn't want to see that scene. This is not what I wanted. Yeah. That's not what I wanted. Yeah. And it is one of, it's like the top horror scene as well as drama. Yes. Um, <laughs> because it is, like you said, the corpses and everything, the yeah. stomping, adding to his like, Almost like a panic attack, but yeah. decent derealization. I don't even know what you want to call it. Yeah. So many words could be up applied to this. He even like walks out of there and you can see other people throwing up and like yeah. full snot nose crying and everything. Like it is, it's just, wow. Yeah. <laughs> That's a great scene. Uh, yeah. He's meant to the stomping. I forgot about that. The stomping even was so genius because in the trailer you hear that noise and you don't, I thought it was something related to the bomb, like yeah. some kind of countdown or whatever. And when you see it in context, it's even more horrifying. Yeah. It's just. You have it wrote 
uh, down as like a name. Mine is literally the speech slash stomping seed yeah, because right. it's the two defining things. He's giving a speech, I believe, right? But yeah. like it, it quickly derails into like uh, he's like not talking anymore because they're still because they're all just applauding, applauding, and, and then the noise and it's like this like yeah. uh, you're like overstimulated with him. Yeah, it's incredible and yeah, Great it's incredible. Scene. Great picks, fantastic scenes. Now we can breathe and move yeah. on to some some funny scenes. <laughs> oh, I'm excited. Uh, yeah, so here is our our counterpart to that. Our best so scene parentheses comedy. Um, okay, so the kickings off. My this is tough. There was a lot of really great comedic scenes this oh, year. Yeah. Um, just really quick honorable mentions. One is to like a very famous scene, but the corpse reanimation in Dungeons and Dragons is uh, hilarious. So <laughs> oh, yeah. Funny. The you have three wishes the, the, scene? The, the three yeah, wishes scene. Yeah, the three wishes scene. So fucking funny. <laughs> Why would you end that with a question mark? That's literally phrasing it I as didn't. an E. <laughs> <laughs> Great scene. And then also the, the car bomb from Bottoms. Um, Hazel is <laughs> an absolute fucking wild card, and I adore her, and this scene is so funny. It's just, it, it elevates it of like, oh, oh, you just actually bombed a car. Okay, great. great yeah. Great, great. Yeah. Um, but my, and my, uh, to quickly add into that, it's like just a little bit later in that movie, it's like, oh, now you want a bomb. <laughs> right. Please just go watch that movie. It's incredibly funny. It's so funny. Um, but for my big five, my number one is going to be a movie that we just have not talked about at all so far, which is so sad because I love this movie. This is going to be the dinner theater performance from Theater Camp, um, which <laughs> is uh, the, the scene where Troy gets together all these kids to perform for his investors um, at their dinner. Utterly hilarious stuff. You have these children, like literal children, who are like, in a past life, I lost my husband in the war, and like fully traumatizing these grown men. Yeah. Um, one of the guys from Succession is in it, and he is fully like telling Troy, like, I mean, some of these guys are having full panic attacks. Like, this is not good. You can't do this to us. And it's just, it's, there's something so funny about kids like delivering these like awful, awful lines, and so funny, so funny. Um, Watch Theater Camp too. Just a great comedy. Yes. Uh, my next pick is going to be the naked beach fight from No Hard Feelings. I, <laughs> that's all I have to say. She she got punched in the she got, pussy. She got box punch. She uh, got the coin flush. She got punched. <laughs> it's such a good scene. And like we mentioned earlier, Jennifer Lawrence was just so surprising in this movie. It just, was, yeah. She's so good. And this scene is like, oh my God, she is just going for it. Like fully bearing it all. Yeah. Really. I mean. I, I think we can say that was probably our favorite rom-com of last year. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. 100%. Yeah. Uh, I mean, to kind of join in on that one, um, it, that talk of that one is... Um, that scene starting up, she starts strutting out of the ocean, butt ass naked, and it just shows that. And it's immediately, I'm like laughing already because I'm like, what the fuck's going on right now? And then it derails, and you're like, oh, and you're still laughing. Yeah. You're still laughing. It's a fearless scene, like for her, to fearless to be like, there's a, something to be said about like knowing that she's probably going to be incredibly objectified in that scene by many people watching, but yeah. like, that's not the point of the scene, and it's very no, clearly yeah. not a like sexy scene. It's just it's her not. beating the shit out of some people. Like It's so funny, and I just I applaud Jennifer Lawrence for that scene. It's so yeah. funny. Um, my next scene is going to be known as the fart jizz fart scene from Dream Scenario. Um, we've already talked about this one a bit, nominating him for Best Actor and stuff, and just a truly unique comedy but this scene is just the pinnacle of ridiculousness um the basic premise is that he one of these girls that's been dreaming about him every night invites him back to her place and clearly wants to start something but the, her dream is very specific in the way he enters into her apartment and all of that and he he plays along he plays the role he's clearly uncomfortable but he walks over to the couch and she's trying to make him more comfortable and they they, they start getting physical and because Nicolas Cage is playing an old middle-aged man, he proceeds to fart, come, and then fart again. Um, and then leave her apartment. <laughs> and I just, I love Nicolas Cage. He's my favorite actor of all time. And I was so thrilled to see him in this movie because it's just another layer to just how ridiculous he can get in movies. And he plays the scene so well of the very quick succession of fart, come, fart. Just right back to back. It's so good. It's 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 hilarious. The girl who uh, is in the scene as well is also fantastic. She's yeah. just like, what just happened? <laughs> yeah. Just fantastic. Um, go watch Dream Scenario. It's so funny. 
Um, and then my, my fourth nominee, runner-up to the winner, is going to be, uh, again, my favorite moment from last night, uh, I'm Just Ken from Barbie. Oh, just like the entire... Just the performance. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the, the musical performance of I'm Just Ken. Um, whereas the rest of these are fully just laugh-out-loud funny. This one is too, but it's also just utterly delightful. It's yes. so fun to watch. Um, I love musical performances in films that don't have music. Like, I just love when randomly they'll just break out in song for no reason, and this is just back to a T. You have him fighting out on the beach, and then it turns into a fucking grease scene when they're all dancing like people from the 50s, and Ryan Gosling just anchoring it all and being the most charming human being who's ever existed is just yeah beautiful, fantastic stuff. Um, I love Barbie. I love plenty of scenes in the film. Um, in fact, one of my runner-ups for the other category was the ending scene when she essentially is questioning whether she wants to be a human or not is yeah. also great. But this scene is just the pinnacle of the movie. I mean, it's fantastic. Um, but all of these are funny. They did not, I mean, Dream Scenario was the one for a while, the one that made me laugh the hardest. I remember not being able to catch my breath in that scene. And then we saw American Fiction. And I'm just and labeling this scene. one the, and the name is in all caps, FUCK. <laughs> 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 this scene, if you've seen the film, um, uh, our main character is essentially, as a statement, writing a a very cliched, very stereotypical, stereotypical um, yeah. movie or book about a, a bl- about a black person. And, yes. Um, the white people in the film are eating it up because, of course, they are. And yeah. the his investors and the publishers are calling him and asking him, "Hey, you know, this is great." Um, uh, any details you want to add or changes? And he's like, yeah, I want to add the, or change the name. It's not going to be uh, Pathology anymore. And they're like, oh, we love that name. What's it, what are you thinking? And he goes, and this is a man who's trying to torpedo this book. Like, he does not want it to get yeah. made. So he's on quite, the phone. He's quite angry about the fact that they're even eating it up because yes. the whole point was that he was trying to make fun of them for liking that kind of stuff. Yeah. Made it so bad on purpose. And so and now they're, they're still yeah, it yeah. yeah. It's, it's a great movie. Um, but so he says, I want to change the name of this book to Fuck. And there's just silence, and they go, um, we don't know if we can sell that. And he's like, no, 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 fuck. And he just <laughs> keeps repeating, repeating the word, and they go like, oh, maybe what about like, damn, or shit. And he, no, 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 fuck. It's <laughs> just, I love Jeffrey Wright. I think his line readings are so fucking good in this movie. So but good. But this is the best, like just the way, and it's just, the scene is great because it cuts back and forth between him and his agent on the phone, and then the two publishers on the phone and you can see his agent fully like stop doing this as he's fully just fuck and just back and forth it's so so funny the movie was just genuinely really really funny in plenty of different scenes but this was the one again in the theater i was sitting there like not being able to catch my breath i was laughing so hard and great great scene i love this scene fuck fuck (laughs) um Oh, uh, what a funny year. Um, we're going to actually start off with something you just finished off with, which is that American Fiction, where he just says, fuck. <laughs> um, that's definitely on there, because I was even explaining that scene to my sister, and even just telling her how the scene goes, she was laughing her ass off. It's just incredibly funny. Watching it is even funnier. It was, I mean, just not expected. Just be like, oh, yeah, okay, cool. What do you want to change the name to? Fuck. <laughs> And yeah, it's just, it's incredible, especially because you know the they um the the publishers that are interested in it um go like we just need to discuss this real quick and they kind of take a second and uh, back off and um um losing uh, train of thought here <laughs> um they back off a little bit um and. Uh, they he's are now arguing with his uh uh publicist I think is what it is yeah, yeah his agent his agent and they're, they're arguing and everything but then they they come back and then they you know they unmute themselves on the phone and they're like yeah yeah what's up um and they go so we're gonna go with it and they just immediately <laughs> go with it and that that just makes um uh Jeffrey Wright's character Jeffrey Wright yeah yep. yeah Jeffrey Wright's character like mad because he's like what the fuck you're not supposed to like this and they're like no we'll, we'll name your book fuck. <laughs> Uh, incredibly funny scene. Um, and then what else do we have here? We have, um, another one you've mentioned, which is, um, from Dream Scenario, is just, just, just 
you come and you fart. I mean, fart come fart. You come, uh, yeah. <laughs> it's it's, it's uh, you you said it already. It's it's a scene where it's like you kind of just think he's gonna cheat on his wife with this like really really young girl, and you're just yeah. like this is just weird. Um, and like, especially because she's like, I need you to like reenact the dream, and it was kind of like just scary. It actually gives a kind of a scary shot of like Nicholas Cage, oh God, like yeah. out in the corner, like barely in the light. I was like, is this like Gerald's it's game with the Moonlight Man? Like every now and then, yeah. yeah. Um, and it just ends up being incredibly funny. <laughs> um, uh, so there's that one, and uh, here are some ones you did not bring up. So I'm excited that they're a little different. Um, a scene from Barbie. Um, is uh, very very early in the movie. It's an incredibly funny movie, but uh, early in the movie, uh, Ken, they're on the beach, and Ken wants to go ride the waves, but they're toys, and there's not real waves, and he runs over at the waves with his, like, uh, surfboard and just, like, bounces off of it <laughs> and, like, flies in the air, and it cuts over to um, uh, Michael Sierra's uh, character, uh, Alan, not a Ken, and it does this quick zoom on him, and he just fucking screams. <laughs> and it just immediately moves on from that. But it's so fucking funny. It, like, just so, like, just out of left field, just zooms in on him real quick, and he just screams. <laughs> and it's just, it caught me off guard, and every time I've seen it, I laugh hysterically. It's fucking hilarious. That movie's just so silly. Like, that's the it's, scene that just, like, they were not afraid to just do silly things for no reason, you know? Yeah, it's incredible. Um... Let's see, what else do we have here? Um, oh, and then my, like, second favorite, because it just got me really fuck. I, I, these are all really great. My second favorite, right before the winter, we have uh, Guardians of the Galaxy 3, <laughs> where they finally <laughs> drop the F-bomb of get in the fucking car. Open the fucking door. Open the fucking door. Yeah. Oh, yeah, open the fucking door. I wrote it wrong here. Open the fucking door. Yeah. Thank you. Um, still great, though. Yeah, still yeah. Open the fucking door. Um, so good. It's so fucking funny. It's, you just, you can't deny it. It's, yeah. It, come on. It's, it's, there's nothing more to say for that. My winner is something that on the way home, I was talking about it and I almost felt like I was going to pass out from laughing so hard. And speaking of <laughs> passing out, if you guys have seen Blue Beetle, there's a lot of great funny things in this. It's a quick scene <laughs> where they had to take the... Not had to. They kind of just took it without permission. They take this truck um, named uh, Taco. Um, and they take it. And uh, what's the actor's name who reacted? Uh, George Lopez. George Lopez. So sorry, I forgot his name. Um, uh, George Lopez, that's a, like his baby. Um, and uh, when they bring back the truck after it got shot up and kind of crashed into, um, he's very upset. Um, and uh, he was like looking out the window, screamed, he took the taco and was so overcome by emotions immediately passes out <laughs> and like collapses into the chair and there is just something so comedic and beautiful about just he took the taco and like collapsed into, <laughs> into the chair and even just trying to talk about it on the way home I was just laughing and like I'm trying to drive and just could like I'm getting lightheaded yeah. from laughing so hard. It was my absolute <laughs> favorite. I learned very quickly that if you want to make Cal laugh, you either have just random screams or you have someone fully collapsing. Like just, those are real easy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but I don't blame a... you because it's just physical comedy. Like it's yeah, just, love, it's physical comedy. So good. All right, moving on to our next category. This is a really fun one. This is gonna be best villain. Uh. A lot of really just goofy, ridiculous villains this year. This was a really fun one, though, and I credit Cal for this entirely. We just decided we were going to be very creative. We were not going to be like, this is the best antagonist of this film. No, we just... What is the best movie villain of 2023? The year. The best villain of the year. So many picks that we decided to expand the category to eight instead of five. So for my eight picks, I'm going to go with... Um, one, like I just said, I, some of them are different. This is just an actual villain, but... He's great. Jason Momoa as Dante in Fast X. Um, so fucking entertaining. He's hilarious. He's ridiculous. He is baby girl. He is everything. He is baby girl. I love this man. Fantastic performance. Love Dante. Um, my next pick is going to be uh, Coriolanus' Snow's perfect fucking hair in The Hunger Games, The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes. <laughs> Listen. Just hear me out. Yes, I know who Coriolanus Snow is. 
Yes, I know who he becomes. Yes, I know what he does. But have you seen his fucking hair? <laughs> I was watching this movie, which was a delightful surprise. So much better than I expected it to be. And I did not expect to be thirsting over Coriolanus Snow. But then this motherfucker shows up with the most perfect head of hair I've ever seen. And I couldn't help it. I was like, I don't care who he's going to become right now. I want him bad. Uh, and that is like 90% hair. Um, so his hair is a villain of that movie. Um, my next pick is going to be just simply David F. Sandberg, the director of The Flash. <laughs> because he belongs in director jail for at least the next five years. Um, I just... I, I There's not much more I can say about that. I... If you're resurrecting dead actors via CGI, you're going to be in director jail. Like, it's yeah. just not... I wanted to say James Gunn for signing off on this movie, but he's got to do what he's got to do. My yeah. problem, though, is that James Gunn is not putting him in director jail. This man is directing Batman, uh, whatever the name is, but the Batman movie in James Gunn's DCU. Yeah. Deeply upsetting. Can't wait. But, uh, no, just put him in director jail. This, The Flash sucked, and David S. Sandberg sucks, and I hope he has chlamydia. Um... <laughs> my, next, my next nominee is going to be The Stairs in John Wick Chapter 4. Oh my god. <laughs> John Wick has faced some formidable opponents across four movies. Some real tough motherfuckers. You mentioned the big old guy in, in the club. He's fought some real badass yeah. motherfuckers. But none have taken him out so badly as that row of stairs. That ginormous row of stairs in um, John Wick Chapter 4. That honestly, I know it's kind of silly, but it could have been in my nominees for best comedy scene because there's nothing uh, funnier true. than him falling, falling the whole way down, <laughs> running back, fighting his way back up, and then just to get fucking Spartan kicks back down the stairs, and you can hear him go oh, as he gets up. Like Keanu and Tom, uh, Keanu Reeves and Tom Cruise. I said like, like I know them. Like you know, my, my friends Keanu and Tom. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And my good friends. Um, they have both mastered the art of, like, fuck this shit, I'm old in action movies. Oh, yeah. Especially in these two movies, in John Wick uh, 4 and Dead Reckoning. They're clearly getting old, but they're still doing these ridiculous stunts. So when he falls down those stairs, you can hear him, like, come on. Like, he gets up, like, I just can't keep doing this to myself. Yeah. It's so good. Those stairs are a real bastard. Um, my next pick, is my nominee, is going to be uh, Barry Keoghan's penis in Saltburn. Um... Because I was not prepared to see that, and not only did I see it, I just watched it flopping around for a good three minutes, however long Murder on the Dance Floor is. Um, first of all, fuck Saltburn. Fuck Saltburn. All my we, homies we hate not, Saltburn. We, we are not fans of Saltburn on this yeah. pod. By not. all my homies, I mean Cal, and not my actual homies, because a lot of my friends seem to like Saltburn for some yeah. reason. Yeah. Well, you know what? Maybe we'll rant about that in our next car ride or whatever, possible. but it's like, yeah. It's very possible. Anyway, um, this man just... For all. Whereas Jennifer Lawrence did it and it was funny. This man is just weird. And I did not want to see that in, <laughs> in this movie. And we did anyway for about three minutes. Um, we definitely did. We certainly did. Forgot about that, actually. <laughs> my, I blocked uh, that out. So. I will never forget about it. <laughs> my next nominee is going to be um, Nicolas Cage's agent. Um, because you're telling me this man... Start hey, hear me out. Hear me I'm out. waiting. I'm waiting. He's my favorite actor of all time. He has the worst agent of all time. Because this man starred in... The movie we've been referencing a lot, Dream Scenario, and he also starred in Butcher's Crossing and The Retirement Plan. Yeah. And I just need him to have a good year, because he always does this. He always stars in, like, a Mandy and then three other dog shit movies. Like, I'm just so... I want him to have a year where he only has good movies, because we know he's not going to have a movie a year. That's not the, the... My man is just on the grind all the time. Yeah. So he's going to star in, like, a minimum of, of three movies a year. Yeah. I just want all of them to be good. I'm not even asking for great, but the retirement plan is just such a forgettable, average, it, yeah, generic that one's just movie. Bad. It's just bad. And Butcher's Crossing has some interesting stuff, but it is so slow and so and boring. boring. And you can tell how bad they are when you compare them to Dream Scenario. That's that's why I put this in, is because they're so frustrating the difference. Like, yeah. And that's not his fault. That's why I said the villain here is his agent. Mm -hmm. Stop booking these garbage movies for him when you for know real? he can do better. Even this year, I am so excited for Long Legs. I can't wait to see what other fucking garbage he does, though. Like, he's going to do some... It's going to be a sandwich of, like, a dog shit movie in uh, April, Long Legs in June, and a dog shit movie in September. Like, yeah. it, it's going to happen. 
But I'll watch it because it's Nicolas Cage, and I will watch anything that man makes. Because he'll still, he'll still be great. That's the thing. Butcher's Crossing is boring as hell. He's fun as hell in that movie. Yes, he is. So, just fire your agent, Nick. I, I'm available. I will be your agent. I will. Anyway, uh, <laughs> <laughs> my uh, my next nominee. These last two are going to be instead of just you know someone's penis, they're going to be actual characters oh, just because okay. they are absolutely right. sinister. And the first one is going to be Julianne Moore as Gracie in May December. Come on, we yes. already we talked about it, but just. We talked about the Charles Melton's point of view, but just from her point of view, she's just a horrible person. I yes. mean, she's just awful. She's a psychopath. She, yeah. She took this kid who was a kid and ruined his life. And not only ruined his life, she didn't like go away. She trapped him for the rest of his life. Yeah. With her. And, and for her, it's love. Like she masks it as love and it's just disgusting. And Julianne Moore plays the role so well. Yeah. She's so hard to listen to. I just, her voice is grating and she's just insufferable and, oh, I hate this character so much, but it, she played it so well. Yeah. Um, all of these villains are so sinister, so evil, so perfect when it comes to hair, but none of them captured, like, just pure evil in a way that Robert De Niro did in Killers of the Flower Moon. That's going to be my winner. And, like, I know I've made a lot of jokes, but, like, this is... I have him written down as William the actual devil Hale. You did. Oh, <laughs> because, wow. <laughs> because he is. Like, I just... I was... De Niro is one of the greatest actors of all time. We know this. He's yeah. given legendary performances. I was blown away by how just visceral my reaction was to this character. I just... Oh, my God. He's awful. He's horrible. He's so thirsty for power and thirsty yeah. for money that he will walk away and and turn his eye as an entire race is obliterated so essentially you know like this yeah. entire tribe of people is taken out under his watchful eye not only turning away but causing a lot of it engineering all of this like paying people off to kill these people it's disgusting and it's just the way he manipulates leonardo dicaprio's character and the way he manipulates lily gladstone's character Fully and, saying that he loves her yeah. is disgusting. I mean, he plays it so well. Just fantastic. Um, not quite an Oscar-winning performance, despite what Tim Robbins would say, but an Oscar-worthy performance. <laughs> uh, that's my winner, just because he... Like I said, nothing this year made me like squirm and like maybe want to hurt a character, physically hurt a character, than, oh, than yeah. William K. Hale. Just put me in a room with three minutes. That's all I ask. Put me in a room with Coriolanus Snow for three minutes, but don't ask why. Put me in a room with William K. Hale, and I'll tell you why I'm going to fucking kill him. But, uh, yeah, that's uh, that's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> oh, that's incredible. Those were good. Really unique, really funny. Um, I'm glad that nothing on my list matches yours. Oh, thank God, because I want to see how creative we got with this. this yeah. Good, good, oh, good. and I kept it... Oh, you'll, you'll see. You'll okay. see. My first one here is... Um, uh, uh, maybe maybe some of you guys know our, our good old friend uh, Matt Pat. He's a ga game theory. Uh, just just retired yesterday, actually. No, don't know. Seriously, he did retire yesterday. Love that guy. Um, and um, he has made so many uh, theories on different um, characters and everything in the uh, video game series FNAF. Mm -hmm. um, and one of them for the longest time uh, was the question, who is William Afton? He's the villain. He is one of the villains for um, that I have down is um, uh, one of the best villains from uh, the Five Nights at Freddy's movies, William Afton, because he actually was played very, very well um, with, uh, I'm forgetting his Matthew name. Matthew Lillard. Yeah, Matthew Lillard. He's just, he actually played there pretty, pretty well. It's, uh, you know, we can have our different opinions on Five Nights at Freddy's. I don't think it was a fantastic movie. <laughs> um, I enjoyed it, but I don't think it was a fantastic movie. Uh, but he, William Afton, I mean, I just remember, uh, being a part of like, you know, en enjoying the theories on, uh, Five Nights at Freddy's, uh, you know, years ago and, yeah. uh, whatever. <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah, the, for the longest time it was like, who is William Afton? It, it just, you know, William Afton, he's one of the villains. Um, a movie we saw towards the beginning of the, the year, uh, of 2023 was, um, uh, a killer robot who just happened to look like a little girl, Mithrigan, <laughs> or Megan. Mithrigan. Um, 
and uh, ha- she has to go on the best villain list because that dance down that hallway. It was a serve. It was cunty. It was a. It serve. was cunty. Uh, we have to. It's it's. Kind of ate that up. Yeah, kind of. She kind of did. <laughs> Um, another movie that I saw that I don't believe you saw, um, The Meg 2. Mm. Believe it or not, just the villain I'm having is just The Meg. Believe there it. is multiple. You get to guess Is it The Meg one. or The Meg 2? Is the villain The Meg or The Meg 2? The villain is The Meg <laughs> 2. Oh, 2, okay. I didn't know who The Meg was. But. Yeah, well, it's just, you know, there's multiple The Megs in there, yeah. um, and yeah. it's the, the second one. The 2. Yeah, The 2. The 2 Meg. The 2. Got it. Um... This next one, um, if you guys have... I, I know not a lot of people have seen Robot Dreams um, because it's not, like, kind of out yet. It didn't have a wide release. Yeah, it didn't oh. have a wide release, and uh, maybe you'll get there. So this might be a little bit of a spoiler, but not really. It's kind of hard to spoil that movie too much, but the, the villain here is Rust. Fuck Rust. All my All homies, my homies hate, hate Rust. Rust. So I'm real. Go- I'm going to just leave it at that. So real. Because that movie is not fully just out yet for fuck some people. Rust. But yeah, fuck Rust. Moving yeah. on. Um, love the movie. Um, all of us strangers. A lot. Love it. But who's the real villain at the end of the day? Death. You guys have done a really great time. We will probably not be back next episode. <laughs> because death is going to visit this house. The, the, the best villain for is is um that I have nominated for this is death because all of us strangers is is no I don't everyone's dead. Moving on, Move on we Cal. have um this one's a fun one from um Oppenheimer. Uh, you're like, oh, who's the villain in Oppenheimer? It's like everybody, right? A little bit of everyone. Uh, but specifically, we have um, uh, plutonium and uranium. Um, <laughs> because when they found a way to bombard the neutrons for those two, that that's what caused a nuclear fission reaction in the first place. So we're blaming specifically you're blaming plutonium atoms. It's not and, their fault. No, I'm blaming those two because they they were able to put them together. You I'm blaming them. The bomb. I'm <laughs> blaming plutonium and uranium for existing because that's what created the uh, t- that's what they used to create the the nuclear like a f- like a fission mm-hmm. the the just yeah. that that reaction. Yeah. That then ends up being in the atomic bomb. Plutonium, you guys are welcome on the pod. You can tell your story because this is bullshit. This is libel. <laughs> we've got the next one. If you guys have seen Ferrari, um, stop. Stop. <laughs> um, um, when you're driving down the road, right, right, in the middle of the road, you've got the little yellow lines, and there also happens to be called uh, the, the official name is the raised pavement marker, but also just like the reflective lights to be able to see where the lines are in the middle of the night. I'm calling that the villain, um, uh, because uh, uh. Go ahead, no, keep explaining. Go ahead. I yeah, want to hear yeah, exactly yeah. why that's the villain. <laughs> Please tell me why it's the villain. What exactly did the raised pavement do to you? It popped. The Not t- to you. I mean, it popped the tire on the car. Oh yeah, and it killed lots of people. That's right. <laughs> You're so fucking wrong. For that. But let me rein it back in. The best villain, the one who wins for me. I mean, come on, it's Godzilla. <laughs> You're such a fake fan. He's not a villain. Let him do what he wants. He killed. Thousands, probably millions of people. Earned. No. Listen, plutonium, uranium, and Godzilla. Y'all can come on the pod and Cal can sit in the corner while you tell your story. Listen, I love the guy. Where's your little Godzilla figure? Because you don't get it anymore. I'm taking it back. Fuck you. (laughs) It's on my keys downstairs where it's supposed to be, but fuck you. He's staying there. Godzilla Minus One is a fantastic film. Is it? It's... It's a fantastic film, <laughs> but, and no matter how much, uh, Godzilla merchandise I buy and, um, how funny I think that video of him dancing on that, uh, green screen is mm-hmm. incredible and I watch it all the time you will and it plays in my head, um, he is genuinely a terrifying villain because, and I think that's what I love about a lot of, um, uh, 
Godzilla films is um, they can't really just defeat him. Mm -hmm. They can't. Because how the fuck do you do that? You don't. You don't. Godzilla minus one, (laughs) they fucking did. They did. And watching them figure out, like, how do we do that? How do we get there? And then actually succeed. Well, fail a few times and, like, it's messy and then they succeed. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Wow. But before we even get to them actually succeeding in getting rid of the threat, watching Godzilla, this giant fucking, just like he's got nuclear breath, like he's just terrifying, actually be terrifying. I don't think I've, I, like you watch all these things, he's tearing apart cities, sure, but like to watch what they did in Godzilla Minus One, I went from like, yeah, there's just like a giant lizard and a giant monkey punching each other yeah now it's, it's the scariest they've ever made him terrifying yeah. exactly it's be it's fantastic bone chilling bone chilling yeah anyways i think i'm really creative for my uh are you yeah, yeah. i mean hey i told my sister about it and she said i'm pretty fucking funny for that's those that's great yeah anyway paul meskel doesn't deserve you um our next award is gonna be the shocked it didn't suck award and it's exactly how it sounds these are movies that we um you know, went in for whatever reason. We just didn't think they were going to be much. We didn't yeah. think they were going to be great. We thought they would suck, but instead, doesn't mean that they were fantastic movies. It just means that they wow, they surprised us. They were much better than we were expecting. Yeah. Um. So for my nominees, I'm going to quickly shout out an honorable mention: um, The Hunger Games, The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes. Um. Not quite in my top five because I do enjoy the Hunger Games movies. I just I don't think I expected the movie to be as, as entertaining as it was, and it was so much more like engrossing than I expected it to be. Yeah. Um, but for these top five, my first nominee is going to be No Hard Feelings. We just mentioned it a lot. Yeah, we, we did. We both agree like our favorite rom com of the year, and yeah. I going into the year did not expect that at all. No. Um, I've gone back and forth on Jennifer Lawrence as an actor. I think that her strengths don't always get used in movies. And this was like a cool experience of like, she has strengths that I don't even see sometimes that were used very well in this movie. She has really great comedic timing. Um, uh, Andrew Barth Feldman was a great uh, counter to her. Um, I've been a fan of his for a while off like his Broadway work, but just fantastic performance alongside her. Great performances of a Hall and Oates song. Um, just a really like sweet movie. It was very funny, but just a very endearing movie yeah. that I did not expect. And it gets real at, at times with the emotions. It absolutely yeah, absolutely does. Yeah, great, great movie. Um, my next pick is I don't know how you feel about this because I don't think you ever thought this movie was going to suck, but I'm going to go with Blue Beetle. Okay. Because listen, and I feel like I'm allowed to say this as a huge DC fan. DC movies suck <laughs> for the most part. I just yeah. talked about David S. Sandberg being in director jail for the Flash. Like, also, if you would have told me of the three. DC releases last year, Aquaman 2, The Flash, and Blue Beetle, which one would be the genuine best? Is Blue Beetle? I would not believe you. I mean, I've waited for a live-action The Flash movie for years. So, seeing that train wreck was so disappointing, and I think that came out before Blue Beetle, if I'm correct. They were close, but I think Blue Beetle was in, like, August... So they were both it towards was. the end Blue of the Beetle summer. It was. was in August, and we saw um, The Flash on, like, a vacation trip. Yeah, in, like, July or yeah. something. So that even that affected this of, like, I was going into the Blue Beetle movie very pessimistic and thinking. And also there was so much drama behind the scenes of how they were, the Warner Brothers executives were fucking with the movie and hearing about what happened with the Batgirl movie and all of that. I was like, there's just no chance yeah. this movie is going to come out as a finished thing. And seeing it, I was so happy to be wrong. It's such a fucking good movie. It's a great origin story for Jaime. Um, just really entertaining, really funny. Clearly a fantastic George Lopez performance. Um, and it's just... It, 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 is hope, it makes me hopeful that we are going to see more of him. Where the way they set things up at the end with Ted Cord And the way that James Gunn has been so vocal about how he supported the making of this movie. I'm just... I. Fingers crossed, I, th- I need James Gunn to fold this into his DC universe. Like, bring the cast back. Um, bring uh, the main character. I forget the actor's name who played um, Jaime, but fantastic. Bring yeah. him back. Bring the whole cast back and let them keep doing this and building this world because it was just a really solid origin story in a, in a year where, like, comic book movies ranged from fucking terrible to Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. Like, they were yeah. all across the board in terms of quality, and Blue Beetle was right up there at the top. Yeah. So, great movie. Um 
My next nominee is one you've mentioned already, but Air, one of your best picture nominees. Yeah. I, I love this movie. I was very surprised. I I would say I was, a, I was a little more interested in it than maybe you were just because I, I, lo- I love Michael Jordan. Like, I was familiar with the story. Mm-hmm. I love Matt Damon and Ben Affleck. But I just, it, it looked like such a dad movie. Like, a very, like, cliche, by the books, dudes rock kind of movie. Yeah. But it was a cliche, by the books, dude rocks movie, but, like, in a good way. You know? Like, it yeah. was, the soundtrack is killer. Ben Affleck oh, is... I forgot about so, that. Oh, trust me. That'll be mentioned in, like, another award. Um, but uh, Ben Affleck is great. Matt Damon is great. There's another phone scene in that that rivals the American fiction one where um, uh, another sports agent calls Matt Damon and basically just screams at him the entire time. Just tells him, like, you better stop fucking visiting Michael Jordan's house. Like, he's mine. It's just so funny seeing these grown men back, go back and forth and... I don't know. There was a lot more heart to it than I expected. It wasn't mm-hmm. just about like how this shoe was made because you you hear on paper like this is a movie not about Michael Jordan, but a, about how the fucking Air Jordan shoe was made based off of Michael Jordan. And I'm yeah. like, why do I want to watch a movie about a shoe? And they make it so inspiring somehow. They're like, no, this is a, not about a shoe. It's about like the legend behind it and about the inspiration that he causes for other people. And it was yeah. just it was a really cool movie. It was very endearing. I, I loved the. The, the back and forth between all of them. Um, my my runner-up, not my winner, but my next pick is going to be Theater Camp. Just a movie that I, in terms of comedies, I just think about all the time. I, yeah. It's endlessly quotable. And it's not a movie that I heard a lot about, but as someone who does love musical theater, I also know that musical theater people are fucking insufferable. And the people who made this can be fucking insufferable sometimes, Ben Platt especially. So going into this thinking, like, this could either be a really funny movie or so annoying. And it thankfully was the the, the former. It was so funny. It was very clever because you can tell it's made by theater people who adore theater as a medium and it, they, they treasure it but also know that theater kids are annoying. So, like, it's self-aware, and it's, yeah. like, it's still making fun of them, but in a very loving way. And I think that's what made it so special. And, like, yeah. also bringing in a character like Troy was a really smart move of, like, the outsider who doesn't understand yeah. anything that's going on, but he's, like, so in for it. Like, he's just such a supportive person and yeah. very nice to everyone. It's it's just a very funny movie, and uh, the even the original music they wrote for it was genuinely... Bangers, bangers, like, incredible music. Love the music, love the performances. Um, I mean, if you're talking about people who won the year, not in terms of awards, Ao Adebiri won the year with like The Bear and Spider Verse and Bottoms, and this. She has a great side role in this. It's so fucking fun. Um, I would let her teach me combat any day of the week. Just saying. Um, me too. But for my winner is going to be one that I was excited for, but just knowing the track record of movies like this, I was dreading watching and that's going to be Dungeon, Dungeons and Dragons Honor Among Thieves. Oh. Just a movie that I, if you say they're making a and d movie, I have a million questions. I'm like, how are they going to adapt a, a world that is constantly evolving, doesn't have a quite narrative to it. It, it, it it's, a, it's really you're adapting a fictional universe. You're not adapting a story. Yeah. Which is so hard to do. I don't know how you do that, but I think the approach they took to it was so clever in the smartest way they could have done it, which yeah. is essentially just make Guardians of the Galaxy, but in the D&D world. Yeah. Really. Like, it's just, it's this found family trope. It's this really clever writing. It's so funny. You get really charming actors. Like, Chris Pine is so fun in the lead role. Um, and they just committed to it. Like, it was it was another example, kind of like Theater Camp, of like, it made by people clearly who love this universe, but also know not, not, to avoid, like, the more cringy part of the universe. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So it was, it was just a perfect mix. It was a such a fun movie, just very easy to watch, and just an entertaining fantasy movie. And I can't wait. I, I need it to make a lot of money. I'm sure it did, but I need them to make more. Because yeah. if it's the people involved with this one, I will watch a thousand D&D movies. So that's got to be my winner. I like those. Those are good. Yeah, the shock to didn't suck uh, category, when you pitched that to me, I was very excited because I was like, oh, that's a fun way to talk about movies that we just... To talk about the fact that we walked in, not kind of like, not dreading it, but just not being like excited for it, not yeah. looking forward to it. Um, and um, when you actually brought up uh, Blue Beetle, that mm. is on my list. Um, because like you said, DC doesn't have great movies. No. And um, I watched uh, 
Batman the Brave and the Bold, um, that animated show, uh, growing up. And so, like, that was actually my introduction of, like, Batman as a character, like, as, just as a kid. Mm-hmm. I didn't know anything about DC. Like, here's here's some animated shows. These are how you get introduced to these characters. And Blue Beetle's a prominent character in, in like, at least oh, yeah. the first few seasons. And, um, he's in the first episode. Yes, he is. Yeah. So he's... You, like, when I hear Blue Beetle live action, I'm like, for real? <laughs> and I was terrified because DC movies aren't good. No. But Blue Beetle was very good. <laughs> so that I was very, very satisfied and happy with. Um, and that from went from, like, a, I'm shocked it didn't suck, but I'm, like, shocked that I'm, it's, like, a favorite. Yeah. Like, I really like that movie. Yeah. Um, another one that I'm shocked it didn't suck, but it... It's not a great movie. Uh, Five Nights at Freddy's is not a great movie, but it did not suck as much as I thought it would, genuinely. Yeah. It was pretty enjoyable. The The animatronics part portion was pretty good. When it comes to just a coherent story, it did have a coherent story. Sure. Um, I have my nitpicks. I could nitpick that movie a lot, to be fair. Like, a lot. But it did not suck as much as I thought it did. And I'm going to give it the, like, you know, I'm going to add that to this list, not give it the award, but I'm going to add it to the list of, like, shocked it didn't suck because sure. I thought it was going to suck. Yeah, I mean, a Five Nights at Freddy's movie, the floor is, like, it could be abysmal. And it yeah. wasn't abysmal. It was not terrible. No. no. And my boy Matt Pat was in there. Matthew Patrick. And he, he said the fucking line. He did. He said the thing. He said the thing. That wins me a little bit of brownie That points. makes it worth it alone. Yeah, a little bit. That yeah. was that was the highlight. Um uh, another one that you brought it up as well. Um, uh, did you? You might have. Scream 6. Did you I bring did up Scream 6? Okay. We're thinking, I was thinking of something else then. Scream 6. That's actually going to be in my shock did it and suck list. I know a lot of people were very excited about Scream. Um, Scream 5 was not good. In my opinion. I did not like Scream 5. Um, but so I walked into Scream 6 and a lot of other people were excited about it. So I just was kind of like looking forward to seeing it because it's just a Scream movie, right? Like, you know, good slasher with Love the face. The like, movies, it's the yeah. concept. Like, it's great. But Scream 5 wasn't good. So when it comes to like characters and like reveals or just, I don't know, you know, the basics of Scream, was wasn't looking forward to it. Like, I just was like, this is going to be a whatever movie. I walked out of that with Kyle Literally jumping up and down and screaming about it on my way to the car in a great way. Yeah. Scream 6 is now very high up there. It's either going to be my favorite or right below the first one. Like, yep. it's just... It's up there. Um, I think they took the characters from the uh, uh, fifth one and gave them so much more development and character and personality yeah. in... Scream 6. Yes. And great shots and great scenes that I, like, are, are memorable. Like, uh, uh, hello, a shotgun in a gas station? Or, like, a communion store, I mean? Like, that's so cool. Like, it was a quick so scene, but it's so cool. Like, yeah. it just... And the uh, the reveal was great. I mean, hello, a double knife swipe. Like... Beautiful. We were jumping out of our chairs just Beautiful. at that scene alone. Yeah. It was incredible. So, that, I'm shocked that one didn't suck because I did not have high hopes, personally. Yeah. Um, the next one on here is going to be, um, Indiana Jones in the Dial of Destiny. Yeah. That I did not have high hopes for. No. I don't think a lot of people did because 4 sucked. Um, we rewatched 4 and like we have a, we could talk about that another time. But yeah. like, I just didn't have high hopes for it. I didn't. I was pretty, I was pretty nervous because Indiana Jones as a series is fucking fantastic. And I have pretty deep connections to that. I just can't remember my dad showing it to me. It just, like, it feels like the oldest movie I can remember besides, like, Star Wars. Um, and uh, I just, I love Indiana Jones. Like, they even just, like, the, the, the you hear the score and you're just like, oh, yeah. so good. Um, and I just wasn't, I don't know, I wasn't, I was kind of nervous going into it. And I actually enjoyed it probably more than most, but I enjoyed it a lot. And there was a scene at the end that actually made me cry. Oh, yeah, there's a... Real punch at the end of that movie. It, yeah, and it, it got me to cry. And I'm like, you know what? I like it. Plus, that, like, passing the torch method that I've seen in a few other movies recently is gone up and down. I like it in Indiana Jones. I like... It makes more sense in this one. It does. Yeah. And I like it in the way they do it and everything. I like it. So that's, that's really high up there for me. My winner... Is going to be your honor- honorable mention, Hunger Games in oh, well. the 
ballads of you, songbirds and snakes. There you go. Yeah, you there we go. Keep doing it for you. <laughs> um, you're helping me. Um, and um, yeah, that's gonna be that one because the Hunger Games movies are good. I heard I'm like it's gonna be about snow, <laughs> and I made a face. Um, uh, I've read the original books. I've not read like the, the this one. Um, so I didn't know anything about it. I just saw I'm like it's about snow. It's a prequel. I'm like. I don't know how I feel about this. Um, I think Years I ended up... after the original, too. Yeah, like, yeah. I was like, I don't know. I'm like, I'm going to tell my mom about it, who's probably excited, but like, I don't know. I think I found out it was like, what, almost three hours? Close, yeah. I was like, that's a long movie. And now it's my favorite Hunger Games movie, topping the original ones. Because it is fantastic. He's got amazing hair. Snow lands on top. Snow lands on top. Um... You, uh, it breaks the movie up into like three parts, and even like that second, that that like la- last portion of the movie is a completely different pacing than the rest. Like it feels like a different book. Yeah. But it is fantastic. It is just incredible um, storytelling. It's amazing characters. There's like new songs. Like it's. The, the the games itself are mm-hmm. really interesting because it's completely different than what we know. It's really very... It's so interesting to see the world that we knew years before. And so a lot of things haven't even developed yet. And it's just... It's very interesting. And I thought about that movie for a long time. And it's like a favorite. It's, uh, like I said, my new favorite Hunger Games movie. <laughs> it's that and then like Catching Fire right below it because Catching Fire is really good. But like, it's... Yeah. That's great. V- yeah, shocked it didn't suck. Oh, yeah. Very good. It did not suck. It did not suck. All right, we are rolling into our final award of the video. You stuck with us. Here's your your, your prize. You get the final award, um, and that is best soundtrack. And yeah. I think for this one, you did a little bit extra um, than I did. I think you chose your favorite songs from each yes. thing, right? Yeah, I did not go that far, um, but that's just because um, I was a little light to finishing this stuff up. Yeah. Um, very, very late to finishing this stuff up. It's been a busy life, but, um, you have a lot, uh, uh, more than I do, but I'm very excited to hear your specifics about it. Um, yeah. So jumping into our best soundtrack nominees, uh, my first nominee is going to be The Holdovers. Um, great movie. Um, it's a 70s movie and the soundtrack is comprised entirely of 70s music, um, and, and Christmas music too, because it's set over the Christmas season. Um, I just... I love the aesthetic of that. I think it was a really just cozy. I, I described it as like a warm bowl of soup of a movie. Um, and I love the music. I, I If I had a standout, it would probably be Silver Joy by Damien Gerardo, which is the song that plays in the trailer. Um, it's a song I'd never heard before. And going into the film, it just perfectly sets the tone for what kind of movie this is going to be. Yeah. Very cozy song. Um, just it's a good one. Good stuff. Um, my next nominee is going to be um, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Mutant Mayhem. Fucking banging soundtrack just yeah. we, we mentioned the the fight scene that goes to no diggity just great stuff but my favorite song from this is absolutely can i kick it by a tribe called quest um that's always been a favorite song of mine in general and the way it's used again in the trailer for this and then just in the movie itself is really really special it's just this even could have ended up on my shot it didn't suck list not that i expected it to suck but i did not expect it to really just sit with me the way it did yeah it's a great movie and it really made me care about the ninja turtles in a way i really have never cared about them it's a good um, way to put it yeah it's just and the, the music is a big part of that because it gives it such a personality where I, I think other ninja turtle movies have been fun but they haven't had a lot of personality and this yeah. one definitely did because the entire soundtrack is all just like rap or hype songs <laughs> so they're all just super fun and good time yeah it's a good time it's it's very fun um my next nominee is going to be what i call hiriyama's cassette collection or the perfect days soundtrack yes just, this is one that's really special to me because other nominees here are like just the soundtrack are just all like not misses and just great music this is one that's special because i think that the movie is fully driven by music like the whole point of what we're watching because it is a very slice of life movie so there's not a big narrative to it we're watching a guy who has a regular routine the same day every day um before it's interrupted by other things but we he has the same routine getting up in the morning and getting in the car and then he pulls out a cassette and pops it in and we get incredible music i mean he's 
Hirayama's taste is just love this man, great man. Yeah. Um, and my perfect is or my my favorite is going to be Perfect Day. It's going to be the title track. Um, another favorite song of mine, and I remember I have a vivid memory of seeing the trailer for this movie for the first time and hearing that song drop in and being like, I will see this movie as soon as I can. I want to hear this song in the movie. And it's perfect. It's perfect. It's yeah. a perfect day. It's just Lou Reed, I think, has such a distinct voice, and he's made some of my favorite music ever, and Perfect Day is right there at the top just because it it's just it establishes the tone and the mood of the scene that we're watching in a flawless way, and it, it, it's just so fun. Um my runner-up, not, not quite my winner, but my next nominee is going to be Theater Camp. Just talked about it earlier. Um, an entirely original soundtrack, but again, like I said earlier, like either on paper you think about a, a musical theater movie where all the music is not from other Broadway shows, but original music. It's either going to be fantastic or the most cringe shit you've ever heard. And it was luckily fantastic. It, the music in this is so good. There's not a whole lot of songs because... The, mo- the movie is essentially building up to them performing this musical, but when you get to Joan Still and you hear the songs, it's just banger after banger. I mean, the title, or not the title track, but the, the big, you know, the finale song, yeah. Camp Isn't Home, is so catchy. And it, it, I love it, too, because it comes from a, an earlier scene in the movie when these two counselors are trying to put their heads together and, and write this play to honor their uh, their mentor and... Um, one of the characters is very clearly elsewhere. Like, her mind is elsewhere. She's doing other things. Yeah. She's not committed to it. So she's writing this song, Camp Isn't Home, and you can tell she has not written anything yet, and they're putting her on the spot, and she's like, um, uh, over there, a girl with an open snapple. Like, and she's trying to, like, <laughs> sing things in the room, and then you see the finished product at the end of the movie. That is all still in the song, but they make it sound so good. Like, it's just yeah. musical theater brilliance. Like, it's yeah. just... They make it sound so good, and I, I vividly remember, again, another moment of in the theater, us watching this, and the moment when our boy comes out as Joan is just a, a legendary cinema moment to me. Oh. Like, that is just unbelievable stuff, and he slays. I mean, he's so good. So good. So good. So good. What is it, Noah Galvin, I think? Yeah, Noah Galvin. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, so that's my also favorite song is not just Campus and Home, but No Tomorrow when he's singing about getting this girl out of like the cocaine, whatever shit yeah, that's going on. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'll quit my job tomorrow, all that. It's so good. I just, the music in this is so catchy and it just makes me happy to be a musical theater fan because sometimes you want to hide that because it's really cringy to be a musical theater fan. But yeah. this is just such a celebration of what makes musical theater good. And right. That's, that's why I love it. Um, all of these are great soundtracks, but... In a year, if there's a Guardians of the Galaxy movie coming out in a year, no other soundtrack will touch it that year. That's just, it's bound to happen. And I wanted really badly to put something else just to be different. I don't care, though, because it's Guardians, and it's these are my movies. Like, I just, I adore the Guardians movies. The soundtracks are phenomenal. This is truly my favorite of the three soundtracks. I know the first two are, are bangers, but yeah. this one just really hits home for me. Um, James Gunn had the task of not only finalizing and finishing his trilogy, putting an end to the story of these characters, but also bringing up a soundtrack that would, like, uh, complement that journey and, like, signify the end for all these characters, too, yeah. in music. And I think that I, I was locked in from the beginning when I heard Creep start. Like, I, I, you have that scene on Rocket's face and you hear the acoustic guitar start. I immediately was like, oh, okay, we're really going for it. Like, we are, we are oh, yeah. getting some big hits this time. And, and the way that scene plays out, too, is great. The whole, just all of Creep in that in that scene is fantastic. And then, um, if I had a favorite just for how it, a compliments its scene, it's going to be Dog Days Are Over. I have favorite songs in this soundtrack that are different, yeah. but in terms of how it compliments its scene, it's just, like we said earlier with the scenes in this movie, I cried at like multiple points in this film, but as soon as this song, but you cried? <laughs> as soon as the song comes in, it's just so emotional. It's the ending of the film. It's the ending of our characters' journeys. We know they're all going separate ways and yeah. some of them are staying together, but you know, Peter's going back home and, and Mantis is going off on her own and, and it's just so emotional and the Florence and the machine dropping in is just a perfect way to represent that. And especially because it's not necessarily just sad, like it's emotional, but it's also so fucking joyous to have them all dance to it. 
That's what I yeah. really appreciated. James could have gone a real dark route and like killed off the Guardians or killed Rocket. Yeah. And he almost did. But I love that every character's ending feels earned. Like it's not like cheap that they don't die. It's it's earned that they are still alive. They're changed. They're different. They've been through a lot of like trauma and growth and, and loss, but like they're still here. And yeah. this song feels like kind of a representation of that, of like, you know, our, our, our original days together are over, but we're still here and we're still doing our thing. Yeah. And, and nothing will top the moment for me when Drax walks out on that dance floor and starts dancing with everyone. After three movies of being this guy who like, dancing is for morons, dancing is for idiots. He's grown. He has his family again and he has, he has yeah. kids again. Like he's a dad again. So of course he's going to dance, you know, like, yeah, it's just beautiful. It's a really lovely moment. And the soundtrack for this film just is all bangers. No misses. Mwah. Mwah. So beautiful. Following that up, um, f- the first one I'm going to bring up is something you've already brought up and probably a lot of these. Uh, perfect Days. Yep. Perfect Days. You, If you told me I was going to walk into Perfect Days and I would walk out thinking that was one of the best soundtracks that I've heard from 2023, I wouldn't believe you, honestly. I remember the trailer, and that song was amazing in the trailer. I just did not think that the rest of the soundtrack would be bangers. Yeah. I think it's towards the end of the movie, correct me if I'm wrong, but my probably my personal favorite, like, just the music kicking in, is, I think, the song Feeling Good. That is the end of the movie. Yeah. Yeah, the actual end. Yeah. Yeah. That was, that itself would, like, solidify. I'm like, this is just beautiful. Yeah. This is beautiful. That, that scene itself is incredible, and that song, that's, that's probably just my favorite part. That's my favorite song, I think, and that one is just, is that, that scene with that song. Um, Perfect Days has an incredible soundtrack. Uh, the next one up is, uh, also, t- uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Mutant Mayhem. Um, and, uh, I, uh, another one where I just didn't think that was, I wasn't walking into that thinking there was going to have a soundtrack that was just, that held bangers. And my favorite one is uh, uh, No Diggity. I mentioned that's my favorite like little like fight montage they do. It's also got a song that I don't think I've ever seen anybody go, yeah, you know what? We can do a fight like scene with No Diggity. Yeah. What? Oh, shit. Yeah. It's dope as fuck. Mm-hmm. Hundred. That's a favorite. That's a favorite scene. Um... And then uh, the next one is um, Spider Verse because mm. the soundtrack's incredible, and oh, I think yeah. a lot of those songs are made for that film. They were, if I were. Yeah. yeah, that's so cool, and they're a oh, lot. They're so catchy. Yeah, they're so catchy. Just like the first one, uh, as soon as that film came out, I listened to the whole thing like all the time. Yeah, I don't. I don't have a favorite from that one because I they, they, there's too many. They all they're just they're really good. They're all, they, yeah. yeah, they're yeah. it's so good. I, it's like I listen to it all like as if it's one movie. I have to like I you know what I mean like it's yeah. not one song each the whole thing in one go. Yeah. Um Don't know how you feel about this next one cuz I know you don't like this movie as much as I do, but The Creator? Oh no, the soundtrack bangs. So but I, the soundtrack bangs. The movie sucks about the I mean bangs. the Come needle on. drop of Radiohead yeah. kicking in. I cannot remember the song title. It's uh it's uh, everything that's right place. Yeah. But it's 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 got it's got a banger soundtrack. Yeah. It's got a banger soundtrack. Um <laughs> but I mean that is also my well, you've talked about it all. That's also my favorite song that they play in, in that is uh that song. Um and our winner Guardians of the Galaxy 3. Guardians the series the movie series itself has been movies it's got a banger soundtrack every time. I mean, if you ask me, like, what's the most memorable soundtrack in general of any movie ever, I'm going to say Guardians before anything else, personally. Yeah, right. Because it's something that sticks with me. I listen to it more than anything else. And I also just have deep memories of being able to listen listen to that soundtrack with other people. Yeah. Or by myself, just in memorable moments of my life. All good times, though. And that's what's so wonderful. It also introduces me to a bunch of songs that I should have have already heard but i hadn't and it was beautiful that it was able to introduce me to those um songs and just i i now have favorites and i also agree that i think three is probably the best soundtrack um and just so and so fun so incredible um trying to pick a favorite from it is very hard it's like picking a favorite kid yeah, it's like picking a favorite well, if kid. kids were cool and like I like kids. Yeah, but if I were to have kids and they were cool, and again, if I were to have them, 
Picking's his favorite, except it's uh, uh, No Sleep Till Brooklyn. Because if I had kids, I would pick a favorite because they're a little bunch of shitheads. But no, uh, genuinely though, No Sleep Till Brooklyn is an amazing drop in there. Oh, yeah. It's It's got the coolest fight. It's incredible. You had a very good point with No do- uh, uh, Dog Days Are Over. That one's incredible. I mean, I could tell you, I could give you an essay on why, why each one is incredible. Oh, each one, but yeah. personally... No Sleep Till Brooklyn. And it's like you said earlier, it was like your introduction to that song, and I can think of like no better way of getting introduced to a song like that. Like, oh, yeah. Because that's now always going to be linked to that scene. Yes, you, it will. You know, yeah, every time I listen yeah. to it, I'm like, I can think about which character is doing what in the scene. It's it's so cool. Yeah. It's so good. Good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you made it. We are at the end of our awards. Everything's been given out. The wildest movies have been awarded. Um... I think we did a great job. Of, I think we also uh, did a great spreading job. Spreading it all over these movies. Um, yeah. Uh, we had a great time doing this, guys. We love the Oscars, even when they don't get things right, because it means that we get to talk about movies, and that's what we do here. We, we talk about movies. Yeah. Oftentimes, we just rant about movies. Oh, yeah. Um, um, yeah. I'm very excited that we started this project and have started at a great time. We talked about all of the movies last year, but now you can join us on this journey for the next, I don't know, the just the whole new year yeah. of all these movies. We've got stuff that we're looking forward to, stuff that we haven't heard of that is probably coming out and is just under the radar right now. It's gonna. There's so many movies that are going to be coming out, and not just movies, TV shows, video games, books, who knows what else. Um, and uh, I'm very excited to see all the upcoming projects we have. Oh, yeah. But please let us know um, if there's specific stuff you want us to address and talk about and like ramble about. Um, but also, we just talked about the Oscars and our own categories and our own nominations and just covering what's gone on and our predictions. Talk with us. Tell us. Yeah, let Tell us know your stupid. picks. Tell us Tell what us should have won Best Picture. Like, we're, I'm sure there's something you're going to mention that we're going to be like, wow, that should have made our, our picks, you know? Like, yeah. I love hearing people's different opinions on movies. Um, but yeah, no, Cal's right. There's going to be a great year of just covering content. Um, I can't wait over different formats over different types of videos look forward to our next video where we will not be here we will be in a car um you will get to see uh, the two of us on a road trip just getting to it's a little bit a little more free form just us talking about whatever strikes the mind yeah. um but it's a lot of fun we love talking about movies guys we love just talking <laughs> about movies and tv shows and video games and, and whatnot and uh we just uh we love having a place to do that so we hope you guys enjoyed this um let us know in the comments what you thought, what movie should have won, best picture. Um, yeah, hit us up on our socials. That'll be all in the description, all the oh, good yeah. stuff. Oh, yeah, and please, we have Letterbox down there. Go look at our Letterboxes. You can see reviews of stuff um, that we see just, like, the day of, and um, you'll be able to, like, know, like, kind of, like, uh, how much we're staying up to date, and we can, you also can see the lists we make. Mm-hmm. Kyle's got an absurd amount I think of I lists. I like 206 lists on my letterbox. Hello? For no That's, reason. It's, and you can see, you can get into Kyle's brain a little bit and pick on what's going on in there um, about stuff like this or even just see the movies that we've seen for 2023. And if there's a movie that isn't on our 2023 like ranked like watch list or I'm like seen list, recommend it to us. Yes. Tell us what we've missed from like 2023. Right. Um, and we have our Twitters down there as well, so like we'll we have our personal Twitters down there, and so like we talk about God knows what all the time. And we also have our, our joint Twitter account on there. That's right. So you can yeah. catch our live tweeting of the Oscars that happened last night. Um, yeah, but it'll, it'll all be down there in the description. Um, we had a great time. We uh, hope you enjoyed this, and we will catch you next time. See ya.